characterized by raised blood glucose levels that is hyperglycemia we know the main types type 1 type 2 then there is gestational diabetes and other diabetes especially the larda and modi and i had said that we will discuss it in this so we are going to first do these three and then we will move on to the complications of the diabetes so gdm a gestational diabetes is defined as any glucose intolerance with onset of first recognition during pregnancy so a person who was not diabetic before is not developed high sugar levels is known to be having gestational diabetes mellitus so what are the risk factors what in which patients you have to look for this one is the advanced maternal age that is if she's more than 35 years of age if she's obese or overweight BMI more than 25 is overweight and more than 30 is obese these BMIs are actually for Caucasians the European people because they have bigger body mass um, and big, they have a bigger build so for us the cutoff is different for us for Asians uh, the BMI for more than 23 is overweight and more than 25 is obesity. So in our females, if she has a weight of more than a BMI of more than 23 or more than 30 or 25, she will be looked for gestational diabetes. Then family history of diabetes, if there was another previous history, that is in previous pregnancy, she had gestational diabetes, then higher risk ethnic groups, so Hispanics, Africans, Native Americans, Asians, Pacific Islanders, Indigenous Australians, they all are at risk. So we as Asians are at risk of these the gestational diabetes. Previous adverse pregnancy outcome, like if she, if the patient has been having a lot of miscarriages or if there have been congenital abnormalities or stillbirth, or baby has been macrosomic, that is a large baby, 4.5 kg baby she has delivered previously, then the chances are that she might have had GDM at that time and she will develop GDM now. So, there are several risk factors, environmental risk factors, socioeconomic risk factors, and the individual risk factors, which play a very important role in development of GDM. And in this GDM, then these all risk factors along with the GDM can lead to the complications, several complications. The short-term complication maternal is preeclampsia and eclampsia. So, she can develop hypertension, she can have proteinuria, fits all because of this GDM and controlled diabetes during pregnancy or to the baby it can be baby can be macrosomic large size baby or it may be a large for gestational age may result in shoulder dystocia this happens when the baby is being uh, during delivery large babies they have the the, the shoulders they get displaced because of that the baby can have higher body fat delivery can become very difficult patients have very prolonged long, prolonged labor they may require cesarean births they can be in need of surgical they can lead to which can lead to surgical complications ending up with longer hospital stay mothers can have hemorrhages the postpartum hemorrhage chances increases and then there can be infections Long-term complications to both mother and the child is of type 2 diabetes. These mothers in turn are more prone to develop diabetes. These children are more prone to develop diabetes when they grow up. There is risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome and obesity. So what happens in gestational diabetes if there is high blood glucose levels, extra glucose will go to baby and it cause an increase weight of the baby resulting in macrosomic babies how to screen and diagnose it's a practical problem in diagnosing diabetes gdm comparison of diagnostic criteria of gdm with a 75 several several uh, organizations have 
proposed seven different criteria. So, uh, and there, that's why it is a practical problem in diagnosing GDM. So, we, uh, the WHO does not go for fasting levels. They just formed a two hour of more than four, 140. They will consider a patient. If you go for WHO, you just need two hour levels. While in the UK, they are considering fasting and two hour, but the fasting is very high of 126. And this can miss some of the GDM patients. The ATA, the American Diabetic Association, which we are usually following, wants a fasting level of 95 and one hour of 180 and a two hour of 155. Any two values, ADA says, can be used. Uh, any two values if are, is raised means the patient has diabetes, uh, GDM, sorry, the patient has GDM. IADPSG is a, is, is, is a working group for these uh, for the, uh, the female pregnant female and uh, with gdm and they say that the fasting sugar should be if is more than 92 at one hour if more than 180 and two hour is more than 155 and if any one of these values is raised then this means that patient has gdm so they have a strict much strict criteria if we look at the fasting of these patients in these patients center to center difference occurs in gdm frequency and relative diagnostic importance of fasting hour one hour and two hour glucose level this may impact the strategies which are used for the diagnosis of gdm so this might lead to uh, diagnose this might if we follow iadpsg we might be taking larger number of the female patients while if we follow nice we might be missing a lot of patients who have gdm so it's it's a dilemma what to use we are in pakistan we are following the ada the american diabetic association uh, criteria for diagnosing screening and diagnosing when to screen these patients that is again a dilemma it's if the patients have these risk these uh, the these risk factors if these have these risk factors what we what is suggested is that the first screening should be done at the very first um, visit which should be at six weeks of pregnancy but whenever the patient comes just do the, the ju just do the screening test and the screening test can be just like that for the fa for, for diabetes that is a fasting level or a two hour sugar uh, two hour post perennial sugar levels that can be uh, used for the uh, for screening of these patients otherwise if the sugar levels are normal at that time then at 16 weeks we need to do the test at 16 weeks uh, this test needs to be done again second test whether it should be done at 16 weeks or at 24 weeks is also a controversy so ada recommends now to be done at 16 weeks Patient, uh, the cornerstone of the management of diabetes in pregnancy or gestational diabetes is self-monitoring of blood glucose more than three to four times. Usually seven times a day they need to do the monitoring. So pre-lunch and pre-dinner, post-lunch and for dinner, post-dinner and once when they are going to bed. So it makes around seven times they need to do it. It is much, should be effectively utilized for insulin. So this can be used these patients are usually put on insulin and that's why this helps in controlling the levels so uh, how uh, the management of gdm should be done mnt is medical nutrition therapy and exercise the first line is mnt or exercise in these patients so the fasting plasma glucose it depends on the glucose levels if the fasting glucose levels are more than within 92 to 125 then we can go for um, the medical nutrition therapy in all the trimesters but if the levels are more than the fasting plasma glucose level is more than 125 or two hour parental glucose level is more than 200 we cannot wait for mnt or exercise we have to jump in and start the treatment as early in these patients irrespective of the trimester they are in so oral antihyperglycemic drugs they can be prescribed initially they were not advised but now we can give them uh, they are considered safe um, they are in category b metformin 
can cross placenta, glaburide is the other one. These are the only two drugs, oral antihyperglycemic drugs, which can be given to these patients. No other non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents are considered safe during pregnancy. So metformin and glaburide may be insufficient to maintain normal glycemia at all times, particularly during postparental period. Long-term safety of these agents during pregnancy is still unknown. Okay, so we have metformin and glaburide. First, we have medical nutritional therapy. This may have exercise or usko. वो बताओगे डाइट कंट्रोल बताओगे एक हफ्ता वो देखा अगर नहीं हो रहा तो फिर आप इनमें से मेटफॉर्मन या ग्लैबोराइड ऐड कर दोगे एंड स्टिल व्हेन शुगर्स आर नॉट कंट्रोल विद मेडिकल न्यूट्रिशन थेरेपी दैट इज इफ द फास्टिंग प्लाज्मा ग्लूकोस इज मोर देन 90 और टू आवर पोस्ट परेंडियल ब्लड शुगर इज मोर देन 120 देन यू गो फॉर द इंसुलिन थेरेपी दिस इज द टारगेट ऑफ द डायबिट ऑफ for sugar levels in gestational diabetes these are the targets targets are very tight in case of gestation um, sugar has to be controlled very tightly in these patients so insulin which can be used during pregnancy is nph and detamer and pump therapy so the long acting nph detamer and pump therapy is there with the rapid analogs Bolus can be given. That's for the basal. For the bolus, you can give as part, lispro, and regular. Glulysine and inhaled and other newer forms. Daglutide. These are not. Um, uh, they are not uh, recommended um, at the moment. There are no studies in pregnancy done yet. So it's either. Sorry, it is either NPH or it's the regular insulin. So after coming to GDM, we can move on to LADA. The latent autoimmune diabetes in adult is a form of type 1 diabetes, which is diagnosed in individuals who are older than the usual age of onset of type 1 diabetes. Alternate term that have been used for LADA is late onset autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. Or slow onset type 1 diabetes, and sometimes it is also called type 1.5 diabetes. Often, patients with LADA are mistakenly thought to have type 2 based on their age and at the time of the diagnosis. So, LADA is someone who has type 1 diabetes but is presenting later in life and is being confused with type 2 diabetes. So it's a non-insulin requiring diabetic patients at diagnosis. Okay? They don't require insulin at the diagnosis. Their age is between 35 to 60. They have a strong family history of type 1 diabetes. They would be lean. That is very important to know. Type 2 diabetics are usually fat and have insulin resistance. These are thin lean people. And then you'll do the anti-GAD antibodies so when you do anti-GAD antibodies and they will be positive and diagnosis of LADA is confirmed you can also do it by do, by doing the C peptide levels so like in th type 1 C peptide levels are suppressed or are low in type in case of LADA they will be low as well then HLA-DR DQ typing can be done and other autoimmune antibodies like thyroid antibodies or um, cytoplasmic antibodies, insulin uh, antibodies, they can also be done in these patients. And the anti-GAD is considered diagnostic usually in these patients. And there is definite risk of progression towards insulin dependency in LADA. These patients within months will go on requiring the insulin therapy. So um, the primary features which differentiate LADA from type 2 or type 1 is that age at onset LADA is usually at the age of 30. Type 1 is in children, type 2 is in adults. Presence of insulin resistance, there will not be insulin resistance, it's type 1. Type 2 patients usually have insulin resistance, while in LADA it may be or may not, but usually not because they are usually lean. 
insulin requirement in type 1 you will start them at insulin at the onset of the disease while in type 2 it will take years and years before patients require insulin while ADA greater than 6 months but less than 6 years so within 6 years between 6 months to 6 years the patients with LADA will need insulin presence of autoantibodies yes in type 1 diabetics and in LADA autoantibodies are present but not present in type 2 and uh, diabetes insulin levels in type 1 are undetectable or extremely low in LADA they are low but it's very high in type 2 diabetes because of the insulin resistance so now coming up to Modi. Modi is maturity onset diabetes of the young. So it's a monogenic form of diabetes with an autosomal mod dominant mode of inheritance. It is a, is mutation in one of these several transcription factors or the enzyme glucokinase responsible for the release of insulin from the beta cells that leads to Modi. There are different type of Modi. Originally, diagnosis of Modi was based on presence of non-ketotic hyperglycemia in adolescents or young adults in conjunction with the family history of diabetes. However, genetic testing has shown that Modi can occur at any age and that the family history of diabetes is not always obvious. These are different types of Modi, 1, 2, 3, 5. And these are the genes which are mutated. The most common is this one, the Modi 3, which is responsive to sulfonylureas. Important thing about Modi is most of the Modi patients, they respond to sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea helps in the release of the insulin. So there's insufficient insulin release, which is, uh, which, is uh, which sulfonylurea can help with. Only one with uh, the 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 at Modi one is the one in which patients excuse me uh, in which patients may end up uh, requiring insulin later in life um, and some of these patients may not require treatment at all like in the Modi two. So what is the difference? Modi 2 just is, is monogenic and uh, while poly, uh, type 2 is polygenic. Modi 2 Modi is a childhood. It appears in childhood. Type 2 appears in adulthood. And there is multi-generational. It is rarely multi-generational. It is 80 to 95 percent. Modi has penetration. Type 2 has variable penetration. Non-obese type 2 are usually obese. Metabolic syndrome is not there in Modi. It is usually present. So Modi is type treated like type 2 but presents in an age group of type 1. Okay? So that's what the difference between Modi and LADA is that Modi is multi-generational, LADA is not because it's an autoimmune disease and Modi is a genetic disease. Pancreatic antibodies are present in LADA but not present in Modi because it's not, again, because LADA is an autoimmune disease. So as there is no destruction of the gland in case of Modi, it's because of the uh, ineffective release of the insulin so C peptide is present in Modi while LADA is because of the destruction of the gland so it's not detectable so like type 1 more like type 1 more like type 2 occurring at earlier age occurring at the later age so that's just the age groups have been switched renal and genital tract malformations can be present in Modi it cannot it is not present in LADA, they do not have autoimmune diseases, the Modi patients, but LADA patients can have autoimmune diseases. Uh, uh, HLA DR3 and DR4 haplotypes are present in several percent of the cases, in over half of the cases. So this can or cannot be present. TK. So thing to remember is Modi is kind something similar to type 2, treated like type 2 but occurring in adult age would.
ठीक है लाडा समथिंग लाइक टाइप वन बट इट इज अक्रिंग एट अ लेटर एज सो मोडी अक्रिंग एट चिल्ड्रंस एज एंड लाडा अक्रिंग एट एडल्ट एज ट्रीट इट लाइक टाइप वन रिक्वायर्स दैट मीन्स इट रिक्वायर्स इंसुलिन एंड मोडी इट डजेंट रिक्वायर इंसुलिन इन सल्फोनाइल यूरिया can is the only treatment which helps in these patients okay we done with the special types of diabetes now coming to the topic which is complication of diabetes so we have two main type of complications acute complications and chronic complications important acute complications are diabetic ketoacidosis hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state and hypoglycemia and there are two phenomena which also are taking which are which are considered acute which can lead to acute complication of hypo hyperglycemia is the somoga effect and the dawn effect i will talk about them the next and the chronic we have microvascular or macrovascular diseases in microvascular we have retinopathy nephropathy and neuropathy while macrovascular is atherosclerosis myocardial infarction stroke lower extremity gangrene diabetic foot ulcer and infections we cannot forget them these are very important complications of diabetes so acute complication i just i mentioned two phenomena dawn phenomena and somoga phenomena the two phenomena which can lead to these hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia we have hypoglycemia and an acute complication needs to be treated much more dangerous than the other complications uh, if not treated immediately diabetic ketoacidosis hyperglycemia hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome hhs so let's go on so dawn phenomena and somogai phenomena these are phenomena usually associated with uh, with therapy and uh, the two things uh, what happens in both of these phenomena is that in the morning when you check the fasting sugars of these patients the both these patients one from having dawn phenomena and one having somogai will have high sugar levels so what we need to do is we need to look at 3 am sugar levels so what happens in dawn phenomena the sugar levels at 3 am are normal and then the body's own cortisol growth hormone says the 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 counter regulatory hormone system it it kicks in we know that in the morning early morning there are surges of these hormone the cortisol hormone the growth hormone there is a surge of it there's they these hormone give their peaks so when they give their peaks this normal sugar levels start rising they are these are the hormones which are responsible for increased sugar levels so when when these there is a rise in these hormones there will be increase in the sugar levels and patient will have hyperglycemia on the other hand patient who is having somogai when you will do a 3 am sugar level 3 to 4 am sugar level you see that there was a dip in the blood glucose level so patient was having a hypoglycemia at that time and because of this hypoglycemia reactive hyperglycemia is taking place in the body so what you need to do here so this so whenever a patient has having hyperglycemia fasting hyperglycemia you do this what will this help you doing in in management it plays a very important role in management patients usually are taking insulin when this is happening the dawn or the somogai phenomena so if there is a dawn phenomena this means that his uh, sugar control is not that good and at night when he is going to bed either you give a dose of nph over there not give it with insulin before meal but give it at the time at bed time with a glass of milk or with a little snack and you give the nph dose there or you increase the dose of the night insulin that is the pre dinner insulin so both the regular and the nph insulin which you giving at night you increase the dose and give them at the same time before the meal so that insulin will cover this rise in sugar 
levels and will counter affect the counter regulatory hormones the cortisol and the uh, the growth hormone surge and thus the sugar level remain in normal if patient's low levels are low if he is having hypoglycemia this means that the insulin which you had prescribed to this patient the bedtime insulin or the dinner insulin which you had prescribed was of high dose so the dose is too high because of the high dose this patient is having hypoglycemia so you lower the dose in this patient when you will lower the dose of this patient this hypoglycemia will not have to happen and patient will have normal sugar levels in the morning the fasting sugar levels in the morning hypoglycemia is one of the most dangerous complications of diabetes acute complication of the diabetes because it can lead to unconsciousness and there can be hypoglycemic brain damage it has been divided into three categories glucose alert level when gly glycemic criteria is when the sugar level is less than 70 mg per dl sufficiently low for treatment with fast acting carbohydrates and dose adjustment of the glucose lowering therapy clinically significant hypoglycemia that was the level 2 is when it is less than 54 sufficiently low to indicate serious clinically important hypoglycemia this can cause brain damage severe hypoglycemia no specific glucose threshold hypoglycemia which is associated with severe cognitive impairment requiring external assistance for recovery so severe hypoglycemia ke liye aapke koi level nahi hai aapka patient jo hai usko dekhne ki zarurat hai koi sugar level nahi hai aapke patient ke dekhne ki zarurat hai ki usko severe cognitive impairment to nahi hai ye thoda ye is level pe bhi ho sakta hai is patient ko theek hai so patient is alert theek hai is a patient clinically drowsy hai magar isme aapke levels important nahi hai isme patient aapka drowsy hai cognitive impairment hai theek hai aur usko external assistance chahiye hamari assistance chahiye recovery ke liye so what are the causes of hypoglycemia please remember this mnemonic it's very easy to remember it re explain re is for renal failure theek hai x is exogenous so the patient is taking insulin or patient is taking anti-diabetic drugs of which most important is the sulfonylurea so re-explain mein aapka re-renal ho gaya x exogenous ho gaya jis mein drugs a gai p is pituitary so if there is pituitary deficiency so what hormone in pituitary deficiency if patient has growth hormone deficiency or patient has cortisol deficiency the ACTH deficiency there is pituitary destruction, pituitary tumors, uh, postpartum hemorrhages causing Sheehan syndrome. So there's pituitary failure. So in all those conditions, their patients can have hypoglycemia. Liver failure, liver, if liver is affected, so all the glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis is taking place in liver. So if liver is destroyed because of because of chronic liver disease, because of in diabetic patients, because of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. So liver failure is one of the reasons in these patients uh, can which can lead to hypoglycemia. If patient is alcoholic, he can have hypoglycemia. If there is infection, then you have then patient can have hypoglycemia and then insulinoma the tumors the insulin secreting tumors can also cause hypoglycemia there are specific new plasms which are responsible which release insulin like growth factors and these are new plasm muscle these are large muscle tumors and these can cause hypoglycemia so whenever a patient of hypoglycemia comes you have to rule out these things so you rule out the renal disorder renal failure which can also be diabetic nephropathy and leading to renal and stage renal disease exogenous the drugs the medical therapy patient is taking you have to look into that pituitary you have to look for liver failure you have to look for then alcohol intake history you have to take 
insulinomas you have to look into and neoplasms. What will be symptoms? Patient will be shaky, sweaty, dizzy, confused, hungry, weak, has headaches and will be very upset and nervous and will be just say both bhook lagti hai to kusa nahi aane lag jata so at that time of upset patient will be agitated and irritated and so when symptoms are consistent with hypoglycemia what you do you just quickly do a blood capillary blood glucose if less than 70 uh treat as high if less than 70 and if you cannot treat get the glucose levels so aapke paas patient aaya hai wo shaky hai wo sweaty hai wo diabetic hai wo shaky hai sweaty hai usko aise symptoms ho rahe hain irritable ho raha hai aur aapke paas glucometer nahi hai ghar mein aap dekh rahe ho aapko lagta hai ki patient so aapne kya karna hai aapne usko treat kar dena hai agar aap glucometer nahi hai aur aap uska sugar le measure nahi kar sakte ho blood ग्लूकोज में ये नहीं कर सकते हो आपने उसको ट्रीट कर लेना है ठीक है ऐसे ही ट्रीट कर लेना है जैसे 70 से कम है उसके लेवल्स सो अगर पेशेंट कॉन्शियस है तो 15 का रूल आपने याद रखना है 15 ग्राम ऑफ ग्लूकोज और इक्वलेंट आपने देनी है और ब्लड कैपिलरी ग्लूकोज आफ्टर एवरी 15 मिनट्स आपने चेक करना है अगर ग्लूकोज लेवल इज लेस देन सेवेंटी रिप्लीट ग्लूकोज इन टेक एंड मैर ग्लूकोज अगेन एट फिफ्टीन मिनट्स इफ इट इज अबर्व सेवेंटी सो देन गिव अ लार्ज मील अई स्लोली एब्जॉर्ब कार्बोहाइड्रेट सप्लीमेंट सो टेल हिम अगर उसने खाना खाना था या उसका डिनर का टाइम था या जो भी आप उसको खाना दे दो सो दैट विल प्रिवेंट रिपीट हाइपोग्लासीमिया इट विल रिलीज द शुगर स्लोली ग्रेजुअली एंड प्रिवेंट द repeat hypoglycemia if the patient is unconscious you have to administer glucagon now it has it has to be given subcutaneously or intramuscular if glucagon is not available which is usually not because uh, it's not available in uh, a lot of setups as well in, in big setups uh, hospital setups as well so what you do is we can give dextrose water iv fluid Uh, in the form of IV fluid, dextrose water, five percent, and then twenty-five percent is given so, continuous infusion. And once the patient is conscious, then you can give slow absorbed carbohydrate. Here, but but if you are not in the hospital and if you do not have IV fluid at home, what you can do is you can put the honey, or you can put jam. Uh, in the mouth, in the buccal mucosa, so it gets absorbed from there. It quickly gets absorbed from there. So treatment of hypoglycemia: take quickly absorbed carbohydrates such as half a glass of juice, a little carton of small bottle of fruit juice, five to seven jelly beans or sweets, three teaspoons of honey or sugar, glucose that contains 15 grams of carbohydrate. ठीक है? So three teaspoons of sugar or honey in water you can dissolve and get give it follow up with more slowly absorbed carbohydrates such as a sandwich biscuit a glass of milk a piece of fruit read test blood glucose after, uh, after every 15 minutes so up 15 minute ke baad you give this we check the sugar after 15 minutes then if it is not rising you give this again and you check the sugar after 15 minutes until the sugar levels are more than 70 when the sugar levels are more than 70 then you give a slowly absorbed carbohydrate to these patients so that's about hypoglycemia coming to the next acute complication diabetic ketoacidosis i am I have put up this cute picture for you guys to remember Diabetic ketoacidosis occurs within four to ten hours. It starts. It's, it's in acute complications. Patient in history will say, tell you history of of uh, a type one diabetic who has missed his insulin dose. Sometimes diabetic ketoacidosis is the very first presentation in uh, of type one diabetics. So they will not be giving you history of insulin, uh, not taking insulin. but they will be giving history of gi upset and febrile illness and they will be young patients so severe abdominal pain and fever vomiting nausea 
these are the patients and young girls or boys like 13 14 years old and they're coming and when we will check their sugars the sugars will be very high and that means that this is the patient has presented this type 1 diabetic patient has presented for the first time to us with ketoacidosis so the type 1 diabetics can have first presentation of just diabetic ketoacidosis no other thing may be saying yes they, maybe they will be giving you weak history of polyuria or polydipsia and that's why they will be landing the first time they are landing to the hospital first time they are di being diagnosed will be uh, because of diabetic ketoacidosis breath smells like juicy fruit gum or this is called cosmal respiration sorry this is the ketonic uh, this sorry 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 breath smells like juicy fruit gum that is called the ketotic smell and there will be cosmal respiration patient will be thirsty dehydrated tachycardia hypertension and acidosis will be there when you will do blood tests you will see a high blood sugar which is more than 240 there will be hyperkalemia and there will be polyuria and what is the treatment you will hydrate the patient you will give insulin and you will treat the electrolyte imbalance high e and patient will improve and believe me these patients can be are uh, can recover completely and it has been said that if a patient of DKA expires that unit should be closed because DKA is a reversible disease okay so HHS HHS is hyper or smaller hyperglycemic hyper or smaller state so it's a it's a, a this one is usually occurring in type 2 diabetics in older age people okay hhs usually happens in them okay because of infections and pres different precipitation precipitating factors dka occurs only when there is insulin deficiency so that's why ketoacidosis takes place because insulin deficiency will result in in utilization of the fatty of the of the lipids and this will result in production of free fatty acids while hhs occurs because insulin there is not complete deficiency of insulin so ketoacidosis doesn't take place but hyperosmolarity occurs in here so what's the difference between the two in dk there will be cosmal respiration there will be nausea and vomiting abdominal pain fatigue patient will be thirsty sweet smelly breath acetone because of the presence of the acetic acid the acetone the acetic smell ketotic smell we call it patient can be confused drowsy hypotensive and tachycardia in hhs usually presents with dehydration stupor and coma patient can be unconscious or it can be a loss of alteration and there can be polyuria for several weeks there is profound dehydration hypotension and tachycardia will be there causes of dka and hhs is stressful precipitating events that results in increased catecholamines cortisol and glucagon so any infection especially the pneumonias and utis alcohol and other drugs stroke myocardial infarction pancreatitis trauma medications steroid and thiazide diuretics and non-compliance with insulin this basically leads to dka even in patients dka is more common in, is is seen in type 1 diabetics hhs is commonly seen in type 2 diabetics but type 2 diabetics at the end stage when they are requiring insulin they will not be presenting they they don't usually present with hhs they start presenting with dka so it's not rule of thumb that if there is DKA patient is type 1 diabetic. It can be that patient has burned out pancreas and now in type 2 diabetic patient has burnt his pancreas out. Completely finished the pancreas and now has no insulin so he is presenting with DKA. 
So diagnostic criteria for DK and HHS, we divide DK into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. In mild, uh, mild, the plasma glucose will be more than 250 with pH between 7.25 to 7.3, bicarbs between 15 to 18. Urinary ketones will be positive. Serum ketones will also be positive. And effective serum osmolality is variable. A9 gap is present more than 10. Alteration in sensorium or mental obtundation is not there. Patient is alert. In moderate, the sugars are more than 250. pH is coming down. It is between 7 to 7.24. Bicarb is much lower, 10 to 15. Serum ketones are positive. Urinary and serum ketones are positive. A9 gap is more than 12. And patient is alert or drowsy. In severe, the glucose level more than 250 with pH of less than 7. And bicarb of less, less than 10 with ketones positive. And A9 gap is more than 12. So, DKA. We can see important things here is there's diabetes, the sugars are raised, there are ketones, we can see the ketones are positive, K is for ketoacidosis, so ketones, they are positive, and A is for acidosis, so you see the part arterial pH, which is showing acidosis in these patients. In HHS, this is hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state, as the name state says so the glucose levels are more than 600 pH is more than 7.3 and that is it is normal bicarbs are normal ketones may or may not you are not usually raised they are low uh, the ketones are low in urine and serum and as I said, it is hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar. So the osmolality over here will be more than 320. That is how you calculate osmolality. So osmolality you calculate by using this formula. 2 into my year sodium plus glucose. This will give you osmolality. And to look for the... Uh, the a9 gap, you use this formula: sodium minus the all both the negative ions, you add them, and then the uh, uh, sodium, you take the sodium and you subtract them. So sodium minus chlor chloride plus bicarb minus sodium is the formula for the A9 gap. Okay, very busy slide. This is how you treat the DKA. So, management of DKA is to correct the acidosis, to get rid of the ketones, and to bring down the sugar levels. So, we do the ABCD, we maintain the airway, the breathing, the circulation, and we look at the diabetes. We do, how will we treat the diabetes? We will treat the diabetes by giving insulin. Electrolytes and pH, we have to follow the electrolytes and pH, we will treat that. Fluid replacement as patients are dehydrated. Hourly glucose monitoring has to be done. HbA1c has to be done. Fixed rate insulin is used in these patients. Clinical judgment on clinical grounds patient has to be judged whether how much fluid and how much treatment has to be given. Hourly ketones are needed and you need to refer these patients through the diabetic tree. So all three of the following should be present for the diagnosis of DKA. The blood glucose level more than 11 or 200 level 200 capillary ketones raised and venous pH less than 7.3 <coughs> excuse me with a bicarb of less than 15 so this within one minute within one hour 0 to 60 minutes you have to restore the circulating volume so you give a bolus of 500 ml of 0.9 percent sodium chloride and you give once systolic pressure is more than 90, you give 1 liter of the 0.9%. So, if the pressures are low, then you give the 500 ml bolus and bring the pressure up. And if the pressure is more than 90 systolic, then you give 1 liter over 1 hour. Along with this, you do insulin therapy. 
you start fixed rate insulin infusion at rate of 0.1 ml per kg per hour and continue patients long acting or you if the patient is on long acting insulin like lanters large you continue that okay or you just or if, if the patient is not then you can start just give the regular insulin you have to do hourly capillary glucose, ketones, bicarbs, um, potassium at 60 minutes, 2 hours and 2 hours thereafter. So, glucose or ketones hourly aap kar rahe hai aur bicarb or potassium ko pehle 1 ghente pe karna hai, phir 2 ghente pe karna hai, phir 2 ghente pe karte rahe hai, phir 4 hourly karna hai. Uske baad, jab stable honne lag jayenge, to 4 hourly hum karenge. 60 minutes to 6 hours ke beech mein you reassess the patient and continue monitoring the blood ketones and glucose, venous gas for pH, bicarb and potassium at the end of each fluid bath. So, you fluids give fluids and you will give it pH and potassium. Karte continue fluid management, you have to give 1 liter in 1 hour, mein diya, then you have to give another liter in 2 hours, then 1 liter over 2 hours, then 1 liter over 4 hours. So, आपने अगले six hours में three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours में आपने three liters देने हैं, ठीक है? So total nine hours हो गए patient को admit हुए हुए, आपने ये देने हैं, और आपने जो है patient को assess करना है, ketones देखना है कि वो fall कर रहे हैं, bicarbonates rise कर रहे हैं कि नहीं, ketones should fall, not fall at should uh, not uh, if ketones and uh, you sorry you change the rate of infusion if the ketones are not falling at falling at the rate of 0.5 millimoles per hour and bicarb is not rising by 3 millimoles per hour and glucose is not falling by 3 millimoles per hour 6 to 12 hours okay patient ko aapke paas aave aapne reassess karna hai ab aapne if glucose is less than 14 or 215 okay if Seek senior medical advice if not responding. If glucose is less than 250, 14 millimoles of 250, then you start with the 10% glucose at 125 ml per hour alongside sodium chloride. So, you have sodium uh, normal saline ka aap, uh, de rahe hai, sodium chloride de rahe hai, patient ko, uske saath saath you have to start the dextrose water 10% glucose. Continue fluid per, uh, management, 1 liter of sodium chloride over 4 hours and then 1 liter over 6 hours and you reassess at 12 hours. Metabolic profile need to be done. Ketones and glucose hourly and pH and potassium. Venous gases and potassium bicarbonate at each fluid bag. 12 to 24 hours pay TK should have resolved by now. So within 24 hours, VK needs should resolve and reassess and monitor vital signs. Review, review metabolic parameters at 12 hours. Check venous pH, bicarb, potassium, as well as ketones and glucose. Check if DK has resolved. If not, seek senior advice. When you will say resolution, resolution is defined as ketones less than 0.6 and venous pH over 7.3. If DK has resolved, what you will do is you convert the patient to subcutaneous insulin if patient is eating and drinking well and switch to variable rate IV insulin infusion if patient is unwell or unable to eat. So, you have to fix it first and fix it. You have variable to add it to the variable. That means, with sugars, ke se, you will adjust the dose of the insulin. Uh, and if patient is eating and drinking, then you can convert the patient on the subcutaneous insulin. Potassium supplements is very important. It should be according to blood glucose. So, we let potassium levels. We see potassium being measured everywhere. So, it should be according to blood potassium, uh, blood potassium levels. If the potassium levels are more than 5.5, no replacement is done. But if it is between 3.5 to 5.5, then 40 millimole per liter of infusion fluid is given and if less than 3.5 then you have to assess ask from the senior because you you will need to go through the uh, main cvp the big veins you have to need you need to give the fluid uh, give the potassium from so um, 
what happens to potassium you might have hyperkalemia initially before starting the fluid but uh, but when you start giving the therapy you start insulin the potassium the potassium starts falling because uh, the dehydration gets corrected and then the insulin also causes shift of potassium into the vessels uh, intracellular so there is intracellular shift of the potassium so patients start having hyperkalemia so this potassium has to be corrected very carefully and the, it has to be monitored and cal calculated very uh, given to the patient very carefully again a very busy slide so this is a slide in which we are go again looking at the same thing so uh, i'm going to go through step by step going through it so complete initial evaluation check capillary glucose and serum or urine ketones to confirm hyperglycemia and ketonemia and cotinoria obtain blood for metabolic profile Start IV fluid, 1 liter of 0.9% sodium chloride per hour. So you give IV fluid, you determine the hydration state. Severe hypovolemia, give 1 liter of sodium chloride. Mild dehydration, evaluate corrected sodium. Serum sodium high or normal, then give 0.45% sodium chloride. If it is low, then 0.9%. Okay. When serum glucose reaches 200 for DK or 300 for HHS, change to 5% dextrose with 0.45% sodium chloride. So these are different. Actually, the treatment pro protocol for DK and HHS is little different between the UK protocol and American protocol. So this, this was NHS, the UK protocol, the University of Birmingham. It has come from University of Birmingham. And this is the American protocol. So there is a difference between the two. The major difference is the bicarbonate difference. So here you can see they have not replaced the bicarb because um, this, according to them, to, to, to the UK, uh, when we will correct the acidosis with the insulin and, uh, and the fluid, the bicarbonate doesn't need to be treated and it will come up. But the Americans, they say that if pH is more than 6.9, you don't need to give bicarb. But if it is less than 6.9, then you can give bicarb to these patients along with the potassium chloride over two hours. And repeat every two hours until the pH is more than 7. So there is a controversy and we don't know what uh, the, the UK people, the, from UK, what, what is coming from UK is that by giving uh, bicarb, there are chances of putting patients into cerebral edema and causing pulmonary edema to these patients. While Americans, they think that it is okay. So uh, it depends on how much the pH is, how sick the patient is. You can balance the condition. You can look at the patient and decide accordingly. So these are, but I'm telling you because... Uh, some people will be saying to you that you have to give bicarb and some people will be saying no you shouldn't be giving bicarb so, so you should know that both of the both of both ways of the treatment are correct ways of the treatment it is just the um, uh, idea or there is uh, the this 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 just just an argument or there is uh, uh, what can i say um اختلاف ہے دو گروپ تھوٹ پروسیسز کے بیچ میں about the bicarbonate but you need to know that you can also give it and why you why it is not preferred by the UK people is that that it can cause cerebral edema it can cause pulmonary edema so they think they say that by giving just insulin and fluids if you can correct the acidosis will get corrected by itself when you correct these things so iv regular insulin insulin you give by iv root in both in dka you give either by rate of 0.1 unit per kg body weight as iv bolus you give it as iv bolus and then you give it as infusion in in hhs you give it as bolus and iv infusion you don't give initially in hhs you don't give the infusion you give fluids and you look at the osmolality if osmolality is not coming down and sugars are not settling then you start insulin in those patients 
If serum glucose does not fall by at least 10% in first hour, give 0.14 units per kg as IV bolus and then continue the previous treatment. So you can keep on giving them bolus. Not You can keep on giving them bolus or you can increase the dose of the infusion you are giving these patients. When DK, in DK, when serum glucose reaches 200 and in, in HHS, when it reaches 300, reduce the infusion rate to 0.0 to 0.05 units per kg per hour or give rapid acting insulin at 0.1 every two hours. So you can give an infusion or subcut uh, uh, insulin in case of DK. While in here, you just reduce the dose of the insulin. And you keep the sugars in case of DK, you keep between 150 to 200. And over here, you keep between 200 to 300. Till in case of DK, until the DK is resolved or until the mental, in HSS, until patient is mentally alert. You keep on checking the electrolytes. And when the sugars are less than 200 in DK or 300 in HHS, you change to 5% dextrose with 0 0.45 no sodium chloride at 150 to 250 ml per hour. You check electrolytes, blood urea nitrogen, minus pH, creatinine, glucose every 2 to 4 hours until patient is stable. After resolution of DK or HHS, when patient is able to eat, we initiate the subcutaneous multi-dose insulin regime. To transfer from IV to subcutaneous continuous in IV infusion, Continue the insulin infusion for 1 to 2 hours after subcut insulin begun to ensure adequate plasma insulin levels. We call it, um, we call it, um, shoot, uh, I don't like uh, we overlap so we are actually overlapping the uh, um, subcutaneous uh, with overlapping the subcutaneous which we are going to start multi-dose with the uh, continuous IV infusion this we need to do for one to two hours so that the patient doesn't go into DK otherwise patient may go into DKA again or HHS again if it is not done Potassium establish adequate renal function. Urine output should be more than equal to 50 ml per hour. If potassium is less than 3.3, hold insulin and give 20 to 30 milli equivalent per hour until potassium is more than 3.3. If it is 3.3 to 5.2, give 20 to 30 milli equivalent potassium in each liter of IV fluid to keep serum potassium between 4 to 5 milli equivalent. So, the fluid which are fluid you are giving, you can give 20 to 30 milliequivalent of potassium in that. Um, uh, then, if potassium is more than 5.2, you do not need to give potassium, and you just check the. Uh, you just check the uh, potassium after every two hours. So that's the acute complications. Patients, they get better. As you can see, within 24 hours, these patients come out of DKA. It is a very hectic time for the junior for, for doctors um, because you have to check the patient. You have to. Um, uh, it's 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 when you get these patients, you will find out next year when inshallah you will be doing house jobs. You will find out that when you de you get these patients DKA, so then you. Call जो है समझो खराब हो गई क्योंकि आपने सिर्फ पेशेंट देखना होता है and the thing good thing about DK if you really really work with them and if you really really follow these uh, protocols these patients within 24 hours are completely out of these this complication this acute complication and they are completely stable and they can survive so especially the DK patients so very hectic time very it just say this the slides are busy the 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 management is also busy like that when when on ground when you're doing management you are busy like this as these slides are very busy you are okay
So coming to the chronic complications of diabetes. So diabetes can cause many com uh, complications. It can cause stroke, heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, retinopathy, cataract, glaucoma, diabetic foot, neuropathy, nephropathy, neuropathy. So diabetes on long term can cause the, the diseases uh, in all, almost all the organs of the body. And in case of the type 1 diabetes, all of these chronic complications, they appear almost 10 to 12 years after the onset of the type 1 diabetes, depending on the type of control the patient is having. But in case of type 2 diabetes, when the type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, at that time, patients have developed these complications. And within five years, these are apparent because type 2 diabetes is actually, there is a lot of longer time period of pre-diabetes before type 2 diabetes. And that pre-diabetes is a time period in which the slower damage to these organs is taking place. Slowly, gradually, these are being damaged. So usually when type 2 diabetics, uh, within five, they, they are diagnosed, they might have the retinopathy or neuropathy or nephropathy at that time of diagnosis at the time of the diagnosis or within five years they will develop excuse me they will develop these complications so biology of the macrovascular injury metabolic injury to the large vessels uh, so we have macrovascular and microvascular injuries the macrovascular is to because of the injury to large vessels which is heart coronary artery disease, coronary syndrome, MI, and congestive heart failure. In brain, we can have, the patients have cerebrovascular disease, strokes, extremities, peripheral vascular disease like ulceration, gangrene, leading to amputations. While microvascular diseases or microvascular is because of hyperglycemia, this is occurring in eye leading to retinopathy, cataract, glaucoma, which in turn leads to blindness. Kidney leads to nephropathy, which is macroalbuminuria, then gross albuminuria, then kidney failure. And nerves, we have neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, which can lead to amputation. And all of these in turn can lead to death or to and or disability. So microvascular complications, their main risk factors, modifiable risk factors are metabolic control. So if sugar is controlled, the diseases can be controlled. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and smoking, if these are controlled, they, then the, the progression of microvascular diseases can be controlled. Non-modifiable are type of diabetes, duration of diabetes, insulin treatment, nephropathy, pregnancy, puberty, genetic factors, these are non-modifiable. So if a patient develops pregnancy, the chances of progression of retinopathy, of nephropathy is very high in these patients. Then if when patient is going through puberty, then the, the chances of progression is high. If already there is a kidney disease, if already there is a kidney disease, these patients have a higher chances of nephropathy development of nephropathy. So coming to the first microvascular complication is retinopathy, which is due to damage to blood vessels in and around the retina. It could occur with varying degree of severity. So this is a normal retina, clean retina. That's the optic disc and that's the fundus and you can see the fundus this and you can see the vessels are very nicely visible. There's no hemorrhage nothing now this is small hemorrhages you can see the dot and blot hemorrhages can be seen and the vessels are becoming torturous there's new vascular formation going on the new vascularization cotton wool spots hard exudates can be seen and then we have large hemorrhage this is a large subhyaloid hemorrhage can be seen which is causing dramatic vision loss so according to the guidelines, uh, we have stages of the uh, retina, diabetic, sorry, this is diabetic retinopathy. 
normal fundus, macular edema. So there is just this is macula, the area which takes up the maximum uh, um, vision, which has the maximum vision, macula. So diabetic macular edema may exist with either non-proliferative or proliferative diabetic retinopathy of any severity, and retinal thickening may be assessed stereoscopically. So in normal fundus, this is normal fundus. There is no macular edema. Uh, this is a macula and the, the edema of this macula can be present at any stage. Okay? So uh, the, this normal fundus, UK equivalent, it is called RO. Then moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is of two stages, mild or moderate. Mild when there is just microaneurysm, little bit of small aneurysm. Stick a little bit of... Uh, small aneurysm like this you can see there are small uh, dilatation of the vessels moderate is more than just microaneurysm but less than severe so it's in between the moderate is in between the uh, mild and severe this one is moderate okay then severe and uh, severe non-proliferative meant more than 20 intraretinal hemorrhages in each of the quadrants. You can see these hemorrhages, venous beading, and irma. Irma is in one or and uh, one plus more than one quadrant, and no sign of proliferative diabetic. So, what is proliferative? It has all these features as well as new vascularization or vitreal uh, pre-retinal hemorrhages. So, there is new vessel formation, torturous vessel formation and there is hemorrhages taking place in the vitreous or pre-retinal area. This is called proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Irma is intraretinal microaneurysms. Okay. So medical management, we can do photocoagulation, laser treatment. We do control the hypertension, control blood glucose, and there should be no smoking. Uh, it can be expected. Um, the treatment by treatment treating, there are odds are good. Patients can improve. Patients require frequent eye examination. Bilateral disease is usually there, but it is uneven. So one of the eye can have mild or moderate non-proliferative, and the other eye will have proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Other optic complications can be cataract, lens changes, extraocular muscle palsy, and glaucoma. So, nephropathy, in nephropathy, what happens is that the diabetes, the high sugar levels, they cause damage to the glomeruli, which results in loss of protein. Diagnostic value, normal microalbumin level is 30 mg per 24 hours. So, when it starts rising, then it is microalbuminuria, more than 30 mg. And then when it starts rising, it So when it starts rising, it means that the patient is having developing nephropathy. This can lead to kidney failure. So what happens is there is a clinical triad. Uh, there is nephrotic syndrome. There is in stage renal disease and there is diabetes, uh, hypertension. So altered barrier function, the podocytes get damaged, the glomerular basement membrane becomes thickened. So first there is normal albuminuria, then microalbuminuria, and there is then frank macroalbuminuria, and patient has nephrotic syndrome. There is impaired GFR, the glomerular filtration function is impaired, and so impaired GFR, which occurs because of the mesangial expansion and glomerular sclerosis. This reach initially leads to increased GFR, then there is a stage in which GFR becomes normal, and then it falls. When it starts falling, then it is end-stage renal disease. It can cause the, there is, along with this, they have a raised systemic blood pressure. 
it can be essential or it can be because usually in type 2 it is essential hypertension while in type 1 it is because of the renal damage it happens it is secondary patients can have normal blood pressure borderline blood pressure and then they have hypertension so what is the management tight glucose control antihypertensive like calcium channel blockers alpha blockers and ace inhibitors alpha blockers and ace inhibitors are considered better drugs they have shown better results and they have also shown and uh, they have also shown to play great role in prevention of progression of disease nephropathy in diabetic patients patients then are in the end might need dialysis or they can go for transplant prevention is by controlling the blood pressure the blood glucose if there is re uh, recurrent utis they are predisposed to recurrent UTIs that should be controlled no nephrotoxic substances so the drugs which can cause nephrotoxicity uh, they should not be given sodium and protein intake should be decreased in these patients coming to neuropathy nerve fiber degenerates and blood vessels supplying the nerves are grossly diseased they are classified as symmetrical focal and multifocal cranial asymmetrical low limb truncal and limb mononeuropathies diabetic asymmetrical proximal motor neuropathy hip knee back pain loss of reflexes there is also another classification uh, autonomic neuropathy it can be sensory neuropathy it can be motor neuropathy it can be mononeuritis multiplex these are the various ways they are, it can occur uh, the presenting features can be uh, an, uh, the loss of sensations or it can be paresthesias or it can be burning sensation, tingling sensation, it can be um, pain, uh, severe pain, uh, burning sensation and pain. This can present as nerve damage, as foot drop, wrist drop. The most common cranial nerve involvement is a third nerve and sixth nerve, so it can present with uh, with, uh, with ptosis, with the um, diplopia, which are temporary, which get improved after some time. With treatment of diabetes, they improve as well. So the management is to control the serum glucose levels. Pain needs to be controlled. So analgesics, tricyclic antidepressants and anticonvulsants are the drugs which are used to control the pain. So how is this happening? Okay, we'll skip this. We'll just go to the next one. So the cardiovascular diseases, major source of mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes. Approximately two-thirds of people with diabetes die of heart diseases or stroke. Men with diabetes face a two-fold increased risk for coronary heart, cardiovascular heart, coronary heart disease and women have a three to four-fold increased risk. Diabetics more likely to develop MI, congestive heart failure. So men, this, this three to four-fold increased risk occurs in women after menopause. Premenopausal women don't have this. Postmenopausal women are the one which will have three to four fold increased risk. About two out of three people with diabetes die of heart disease, two to four times higher risk of stroke, and this is all because of the atherosclerosis. Affects hypertension affects 20 to 60 percent of all diabetes, and this hypertension in turn causes increases the risk of retinopathy and nephropathy. Diabetes also increases the susceptibility to infections. Predisposition is combined effect of uh, other complications. So neuropathies, nephropathy, they all can are leading to this. Uh, usually the neuropathy is leading to the complication infections. Normal inflammatory response is diminished, slower than normal healing. Periodontal disease, dental diseases, dental abscesses is very common. Foot ulcer infections are very common, very important to take care. Otherwise, they can lead to amputation and loss of feet. It is due and these are due to the comp other 
this is because of the other complication chronic complications of diabetes so patients are diabetic patients are immunocompromised because wbc's the tlc's the white cells which are the fighting cells because of the hyperglycemia they become sluggish they become they 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 their their functioning is affected once that occur they 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 difficult to treat the ulcers when occur it is difficult to treat the infection is difficult to treat because of the poor circulation because of atherosclerosis antibiotics they know not get there because of the atherosclerosis they slug, sluggish wbc's then the wounds we do not know where exactly the wounds are the concern is basic the foot foot infections and foot wounds are of particular concern high risk for foot infections is, depends on duration of diabetes increase a smoking decrease peripheral pulses so vascular peripheral vascular disease is present is at high risk if there is decreased sensation so if there is neuropathy if there is already deformities or there are pressure areas if there is history of foot ulcers so heart, then there is high risk for foot infection how the progression takes place first there is injury to the soft tissue injury there are no it is not sensed people do not and this don't get the sensation of warm or cold then these areas they get infected there is drainage swelling redness there can also be gangrene because of the atherosclerotic disease so high risk foot infections also the, the complication two main chronic complication which leads to the foot infections is neuropathy and peripheral vascular disease neuropathy will cause decrease the pain sensation which decreases the pain pressure sensation these two sensations are decreased autonomic dysfunction causes the dryness this all leads to fissure so they will not know they will we will we get patients who have put their foot on while traveling on the bike have put their foot on silencer and they are getting burned and they will not know that the foot has gotten burned or they are wearing shoe with the with with the stone in it and they will not feel that stone or if something enters the shoe like like a nail they will not feel and that nail will damage them they will not know they have they will the foot will be bleeding and they will not know that they have been injured because there will be loss of sensations peripheral vascular disease this decreased circulation because of the because of atherosclerosis sluggish wbcs are there oxygenation is not taking place which leads to poor wound healing and you need to give antibiotics but still and this leads to gangrene formation so this is the diabetic foot ulcer theek hai neuropathy hai idhar and this is the gangrene so vascular disease hai gangrene is the death of tissue in the part so foul spelling discharge in this these are usually dry wounds so jo the neuropathy hoti hai uske jo wounds hote hain wo wet hote hain because wo wo usme ब्लड सप्लाई होती है मगर जो पेरिफर वेस्कुलर होते हैं वो ड्राई गैंग्रीनस होते हैं क्योंकि उसमें ब्लड सप्लाई नहीं होती है इसमें पेन होता है न्यूरोपैथिक में इसमें सॉरी न्यूरोपैथिक में पेन नहीं होता है पेरिफर वेस्कुलर डिजीज वाले में पेन होता है यूजली जो डायबेटिक फुट आते हैं उनको दे हैव बोथ पेरिफर न्यूरोपैथी एज वेल एज पेरिफर वेस्कुलर डिजीज दिस इज एन अदर फुट यू कैन सी देयर इज अ gangrenous involvement and there is edema around it as well so this is kind of a combined um, diabetic foot so uh, what else can happen they can have boils also known as frankers round pus filled bumps on the skin and usually staphylococcus and uh, staphylococcus or a bacteria is responsible they can have cellulitis non contagious infection inflammation of the connective tissue due to the bacterial infection so treatment is antibiotic and analgesics they can keep on having uti yeast infections periodontal diseases then there can be gangrene not only of the of the foot but of the hand and of the finger as well management is bed rest antibiotics which can be given by topical or iv debridement good glucose control sometimes foot needs to be amputated teach foot care we have to teach these patients about their foot care how to prevent that is very important teach the wound care as well then they have to 
learn about the, the, the special footwear has to be given to these patients which which causes the, uh, the which uh, with with uh, the special footwear are, are off offload they, they offload the wound so what the footwear is made in a way that the area which is wounded you cut out the shoe is cut from there and the gap is created so that the the wound doesn't directly come in contact with the foot sole, the the, the shoe sole. So uh, that's how. And then daily dressings and the bridemans need to be done. So this has to be taught to the these people. So the daily the 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 foot care which these have to do is that they have to be told that look you have to take care of your feet like you take care of your your face. You have to wash them daily, dry especially between the toes, feel for bumps and feel for temperature change. So if you feel, look between the toes and check each toe, toenail. File toenail straight across. So do not cut the toes in uh, like, keep them straight. Do not cut them like this, like the curve we make. Do not do that, but make it in a straight line. Check for dry and cracked skin. Look at the bottom of the feet. If you cannot look, turn them, take a mirror, use a mirror. Track, make a note, a care log. So all these complications can be prevented by managing the diabetes, by lowering risks for conditions, routine screening for this complication and implementing the early treatment of these complications. We can prevent all of these complications thank you um, if you have any questions I hope you have understood the diabetes diabetes is a very big topic it's kind of a whole medicine in one disease so I've tried to cover everything uh, if you like if you want me to talk about something else if you don't understand anything you have one uh, one week's time Please go through these uh, lectures, go through your books, any questions you have, just, uh, just type that in and I will go through them and I will answer them accordingly. The next lecture of which we will be doing will be another diabetes, not diabetes mellitus, but will be diabetes insipidus. So have a good day all of you. Allah Hafiz.